Hello friends, my name is Desmond Edagese and I welcome you to physics class. Our theme for today is conservation principles and in our topic today we'll be dealing with electrical charges. Now our class for today will be broken into two parts so this class will be our part one and of course I know that you will look forward to the second one. Let's go into our class for today. Now in the course of our class today, we'll be learning how to produce charges. Of course, before then, we'll remind ourselves what charges are, and then we'll go on to learn how to produce charges. Also, we'll learn how to detect charges. And finally, we'll learn about the different distribution of charges. Before we go into our class today, I'd like us to remind ourselves of one basic thing I know that you must have learned, the atom. Remember, we learned that the atom is the smallest indivisible part of every particle. So every matter and everything that you can see and touch is made up of atoms. We learned that the atom also has a center which is called the nucleus. That center contains two very important particles. The neutron and the proton. They both form the nucleus of the atom. We also have electrons that orbit around our nucleus. So we have three basic particles in the atom. We have the electron, we have the proton, and we have the neutron. We learned also that all protons are positively charged in nature. We also learned that neutrons have no charge, just as the name suggests. They are neutral, okay? They have no charge. And the electrons are negatively charged. Now, these two charges, that is, the positive charge and the negative charge, they are equal Let's take a look. Notice we have one charge here on our proton, two charges, and three charges on our protons. If we check the electrons, we'll also find one electron charge, two electron charge, and three electron charge. So they are usually equal and opposite of each other. And because of that, they cancel out themselves. So they cancel out each other. There are usually no net charges in most of our atoms. So the normal atom that you see in most cases are neutral with regards to charges. Electric charge, therefore, is the result of excess or insufficiency of electrons as compared to protons. Now take note again, our nucleus here, the proton, okay, is more or less tied down to our neutrons, okay? They are not as mobile as they would have loved. They are bunched up together in the nucleus. So within the atom, the mobile particle within that atom is our electrons. Electrons are mobile and hence can interact with other electrons from other atoms. And that's why when we talk about charges, we base our discussions on the electrons. So when you have excess electrons or you have an insufficiency, of electrons, the resultant factor we have is what we know as the electric charge. Now these electric charges that electrons and protons possess is responsible for what we call electricity. Now electricity as we know it is actually divided into two. So there are two parts of electricity. We have what we call electrostatic electricity and then we have what is known as the current electricity. Electrostatic electricity basically deals with charges that are static. That is, they are not mobile. They exist on the surface of materials, all right? While current electricity deals with the movement of electrons within the conductors following a path, okay? So current electricity is what we currently use or what we normally use at home. And they are generated by using batteries or even power plants 
you know, on a much higher scale. But what we are going to be focusing on in this class is the electrostatic part of electricity. I'm sure in other classes we'll get to learn more about current electricity. So let's go on to learn more about electrostatic electricity. Now, because of the interaction of different atoms, now imagine rubbing two things together. That's an interaction. Or maybe consciously or unconsciously bringing two objects together. That's an interaction. Now, what happens at the microscopic level is that electrons between these different materials tend to interact together when there is friction. We'll see more of that as we go into our class. Electrons are transferred between different atoms all the time. When there is that interaction that we talked about earlier, atoms sometimes give away their electrons from the orbit or they accept more electrons. When this happens, that atom becomes an ion. Okay, the electrical charge on that atom is no longer balanced. Remember we said usually, by default, we have same number of protons and same number of electrons. But when there is an interaction between atoms of different materials. Sometimes electrons may be lost, we said, or even gained. Now, when electrons goes away, that atom is left with more protons. The balance has been, you know, changed. There are now more protons than electrons. That atom becomes positively charged. We call such an atom a positive ion. Now, in the same way, if an electron is added to the atom, we now have more electrons than protons, and that atom becomes negatively charged. We call such an atom a negative ion. Let's take a look at a typical atom there. We said by default, okay, we have three protons, and we also have three electrons. They are balanced. But when there is an interaction between atoms, let's assume one electron goes off into our other atom. That is, the other atom takes away one electron from our atom here. What happens? We now have more protons. We have one, two, three protons and only two electrons. This particular atom becomes what? Positively charged. We said it's a positive ion. We also said if, on the other hand, this atom here is able to pull an extra electron from the other atom in which is interacting with, okay, so we have one added electron there from another atom. What happens? We now have one, two, three, four electrons and three protons. That gives us a negatively charged atom called a negative ion. Now, there are three ways in which we can produce charges electrostatic charges. One way is through friction. Another way is through contact. And we also have another method of induction. Three ways to produce charges. We're going to take a look at each one of them individually. Let's continue. Now the first method of the production of charges we'll be looking at is the production of charges using friction. Remember we said atoms from different elements tend to interact or must at some point interact with each other. Now when atoms interact with each other, okay, they interact based on the electrons within each atom. They may rub off on each other, they may contact each other, they may be slight contact or a hard contact. Charging by friction happens when there is this contact, this friction, and then electrons, you know, move from one uncharged object to another. When there is a friction, that is, they rub off on each other or they contact each other. Now, different materials have different what we call electron affinity. One material may have a higher electron affinity, which simply describes its natural ability to pull electrons from another atom. Some materials have low electron affinity. That is, from their own end, they tend to give off electrons when there is an interaction with other atoms. 
we have what we call the electrostatic series, okay, which is simply a list that helps us to know the electron affinity of different materials in case we need to do an experiment. The electrostatic series is also called the tribal electric series. Tribal electric simply referring to charges that are produced through friction. Now from the electrostatic series here, we find that from this list of materials, the materials at the top, okay, all have an increasing tendency to hold on to electrons. That is, if they interact with the materials below, they will strip the materials below here of electrons and eventually become negatively charged. Our materials below, as they rise, they all have a tendency to lose electrons. So glass, wool, four, all have a tendency to lose electrons. As we go up on the list, okay, that tendency, of course, reduces drastically. So if we have sulfur, for instance, interacting with glass, okay, sulfur will strip off electrons from glass and become negative, while our glass, after losing electrons, become positive, because they will, of course, now have more protons. Now, the whole idea or the whole phenomenon of electrostatic electricity is found in nature. There are different instances in our daily life that this process takes place. Let's take a typical example. Have you rubbed a balloon, okay, on your hair before? Take this girl here rubbing a balloon on her hair. What happens is her hair, which acts like a four here, okay, has a tendency to lose electrons, and hence it loses electrons to our balloon. Our balloon becomes negatively charged, okay, while the hair becomes positively charged. Now, maybe when you get home, you will try an example. If you rub the balloon on your hair, okay, there is a separation of charges. They were once neutral, but because of friction, Okay, now you have a separation of charges. The balloon takes electron from the hair and becomes negatively charged, while the hair becomes positively charged. When you do that, what happens? You notice that the hair stands on end. So you have your hair spiking out, standing on ends. You may look kind of funny. But what happens when the hair, which is now positively charged, the different strands begin to interact with each other? What happens? They repel each other. That is, they push each other away. Why? Because like charges, they repel one another. While unlike charges attract each other. So you find your hair standing up in spikes because they are pushing each other away. They are repelling each other. They are all positively charged. Okay? While the balloon becomes negatively charged. You can go ahead to try also to hang that balloon on the wall, and you find that your balloon will stick. The balloon now has a negative charge. The wall is neutral, but the balloon will stick. There is an attraction between your wall and the balloon. Okay? Also, if you take this negatively charged balloon now and bring it close to another balloon that went through the same process of rubbing on it, here what happens? You will find a force between them. They are pushing each other away. Why? Because your balloon is negatively charged. The other also is negatively charged. And unlike charges, they repel. They push each other away. While like charges attract. So that's one typical example of charging by friction. The balloon was neutral. Our hair was neutral. But because we rubbed them together, there was friction. They acquired charges. Another example is at home, maybe you have a wool rug. You could also try it out. You'll find that if you are wearing a rubber soled shoe or even your socks, you rub it off on the rug. What happens? There's friction and there's also a separation of charges. Charges are separated from the wool rug to the sole of your shoes or your socks. Your wool rug, okay, again, 
Let's look at wool here on our electrostatic series. It has a greater tendency to lose electrons. So it loses electrons to the soles of your rubber shoes or to your socks. It loses electrons and it becomes positively charged. While the soles of your shoe or your socks becomes negatively charged. And because there's a contact with your body, of course your leg is in the sock or in the shoe, your body also becomes negatively charged. So your whole body is actually negatively charged. Of course, not a high charge, but it is charged. Now what happens if you now go ahead, after charging up your body with this little exercise, to touch a doorknob? What happens? Maybe when you do the experiment, you will let me know. But what happens is your body is negatively charged. Stretch your hands towards a doorknob like this. After, of course, causing friction between the sole of your feet and your wool rug, you would find that you receive a little shock. A tiny electric shock will shock your hands. Why? Why does that happen? Because the charges on your hands, okay, is jumping onto the doorknob. The doorknob is metal, okay, and it has a much greater, maybe it's a brass doorknob, a much greater affinity to grab electrons. So it wants the electrons that is in your hands. Your body also is conducting, you know, charge, but it wants it. As the charge jumps from your body, you know, to the doorknob, just before there is contact, there is a shock. There is a transfer. That transfer causes like a little shock, and then you feel it in your body. So that's another way, you know, through which charges can be created through friction. Another way is rubbing a glass rod on a silk. When you rub a glass rod on a silk, what happens? Our rod becomes positively charged, okay? And our silk becomes negatively charged. The glass rod, okay, loses electrons, loses electrons and becomes positively charged while the sick material becomes negatively charged. That glass rod, if you raise it over some sand particles, you will see it attracting those particles. The glass rod has become charged. Another example is your pen. You can take a pen, quickly rub on your hair a little bit, okay? Cut little slices of papers on your table and try to raise the pen over those papers. What do you find? You find that the pen attracts the papers, can actually lift those little bits of paper up. What happens? The pen, okay, has become negatively charged. And now you can use it, you know, to pick up those uh, paper bits. Finally, if you rub an ebonite rod with four, okay, what happens? See the hands here rubbing vigorously our uh, ebonite rod with four. What happens? Our four becomes positively charged and the ebonite rod becomes negatively charged. If we look at our electrostatic series here, you find that ebonite rods or ebonite materials have a tendency to grab or hold on to electrons and that's what has happened there. Let's go on to learn about another method of producing charge. Now, the next method of producing charge is by contact. Objects can be charged by simply bringing them in physical contact with each other. This is called conduction or charging by contact. So, conduction or charging by contact is another way in which we can actually produce charges. Generally, when charged objects touch a neutral object, what happens? They both acquire the same charge. So here's our charged object. If you bring it in physical contact with a neutral object, eventually they will both acquire the same charge. We'll see that in more detail as we go on in our class. All right. Take a typical example. If a negatively charged metal object and an uncharged object, like we have here, a negatively charged metal object, okay, and an uncharged metal object are each placed on insulating stands. 
Okay, there's our insulating stands. In the course of our class, we're going to learn about insulators and conductors. But just for this instance, just understand that insulators do not allow the movement or the distribution of charges. Okay, they keep themselves neutral. So if we place our charge material on an insulating stand, what happens is we want to keep our charge material to itself and not to transfer it beyond this point. So our stand remains neutral. We can hold on to the stand and push okay, our materials from place to place without affecting it. That's the purpose for the insulating stand. So when each of these are placed on insulating stands and brought close together, what do we notice? There is a separation of charge that takes place in the neutral object as negative electrons are repelled to the right-hand side. So here's our charged material, here's our neutral materials. When they are brought close to each other, okay, what happens in effect is that there is an electric field that is generated in between them. And that field causes a separation of charges within a formerly neutral material. This separation sometimes is also referred to as polarization of charges. So we may use these two words interchangeably in the course of our class. Now our neutral material has become polarized, okay? We have the positive charge to the left of our material there, and we have the negative charge separated to the other end of our material. Okay? That's the polarization. At this point, take note, they are still not touching each other, and no charges has been transferred yet. So there is no transfer of charge yet, just the polarization of our neutral material. Then, if we allow the two objects to touch, we bring them into physical contact, what do we notice? We notice that some of the negative charge will transfer over to the uncharged metal object. That's our image here. Now there is conduction. That is, there is a physical touch between both materials. What happens is, our charge here, which we represented with 10 negative charges, is shared or some parts are moved over to the once neutral material because of the physical contact. This happens since the negative charges on the first object are repelling each other. Remember, it was 10 charges within this object. But because negative charges must repel one another, they push each other away. Now, within the confines of the space that they have, they will push each other and stay at the ends of our material. But now that they have a place to move to, another material has been placed side by side them, they are able to push further away, away from the first material, and they push, the charge is now pushed into our once neutral material. They spread away from each other. When the negative object is later removed, what happens? We'll find that it will not be as negative as it once was. Here's a charged material that had 10 negative charges. Now, if you look at it, it has just five. The other five has been transferred to the ones neutral material. Both of the objects now share the same negative charge. And this depends on the size of the objects and the materials they are made of. So if we have a larger material here, more charges will move down. If we have a smaller one, less charges will move down. So basically, we'll find that neutral objects can be charged by what? Bringing them in contact with charged objects. So now we see that charges can also be produced by physical contact between charged materials and neutral materials.
Let's go on to learn about the induction method of creating charges. Induction. Now, sometimes we can charge objects without a physical contact. This method is called charging by induction. A charged object is brought near a neutral object, giving it an opposite charge without losing any of its own charge. Let's take a look at our materials here. So we have a charged object brought near a neutral object. We'll find that at the end of our experiment, which we'll be looking at now, we'll find that we'll have negative charges on the other end of our once neutral object, while the charges on our originally charged object remains exactly the same. No change. This kind of charge production is called production of charge by induction. Now, for example, if we have a negatively charged object and a neutral object, which is usually a conductor, a conductor is simply a material that allows for movement of electrons within itself, can easily distribute charges within that material. When you have a negatively charged object and a neutral object, that's our negatively charged object, and that's our neutral object, we let the conductor be supported on insulated stands, okay? So we've already learned why we make use of insulated stands with a grounding wire attached to it. This line here and these other short lines all refer to the grounding wire. So what exactly is the grounding wire or why do we ground? We use grounding wires, okay, basically to get rid of excess charges, excess charges, okay? A material, a wire, a conductor is usually sent to the earth, ground. We talk about ground, we talk about the earth. The earth acts as a sink through which we just send down excess charges. So when you have that kind of connection, a wire that is directed towards the earth to discharge excess charges, we say that's a grounding wire, okay? So when we bring a negatively charged object close to our neutral object, our neutral object here is where we attach the grounding wire for a purpose that we'll see shortly. Okay? When we bring a negatively charged object close to that neutral object, what happens? It causes the electrons on the neutral object to be repelled, pushed back as far away to the right as possible. Okay? So what happens is the first instance when they are brought close to each other, just like we saw earlier, there is a polarization of our once neutral object. Polarization, there is a separation of charges, okay? The positive charge goes to the extreme left end, while the negative charge goes to the extreme right end. It pushes it to the extreme. So we said that it causes the electrons on the neutral object to be repelled, pushed away, far to the right as possible. Now, these excess charges eventually travel down the ground wire to the earth, okay? Our excess negative charges here on the extreme of our once neutral object travels down. There is a path created for it through this ground wire. It travels down to the earth and it is sunk into the earth, the earth, as we said earlier, is a conductor acting as a sink for unwanted electrons. So we find that movement here, electrons moving down. Okay, when it goes off, what happens? We we'll find that we have just our positive charges left on the neutral material. Now, continuing with our experiment with the negatively charged object nearby, okay, snip the ground wire. There's our negatively charged material. There's our once neutral material. Now that the electrical charges, the excess electrical charges has been sunk into the ground, next we snip this ground wire. We cut it with 
a scissors. Why is this done? When we do this, there is now no way for our electrons to travel back up the wire to the originally neutral object. Remember we said the earth acts as a sink, but it could also act as a reservoir. While it could accept excess electrons, as many as we want to send and sink into the earth, it could also send electrons back up. So if that ground wire is not cut, it could also send back electrons and then we will now have our neutral material back. But that's not what we want. So we cut off the ground wire so that the excess electrons cannot travel back. Now, if we leave this ground wire, just like we said, and just move the negative object away without sniping the ground wire, the negative charges would go back up the wire and the object would become neutral again. That's just what we just explained. Now, finally, the last step is to remove the negative object. So we take our negative object, take it away. And the original object, if we take a look here, now has a net positive charge. So what has happened? We've been able to create a charge on a once neutral object. So we see that we can actually produce charges making use of the induction method where there is no physical contact. All right? Note that the charge on our negatively charged object remains untouched, unchanged throughout the process. So we started with six negative charges and we end up again with six negative charges. So there is no change on our initially negatively charged object. Next, we'll go on to learn how to detect charges. A scientific instrument used in the detection and testing of small charges is what we call the electroscope. There are different kinds of electroscope, but what is more commonly used is called the gold leaf electroscope. It's the more popular type of electroscope in use. This is an image of a typical gold leaf electroscope, okay? It is made up of a brass rod. There's our brass rod on which lies a brass cap. So it has a brass cap resting on the rod. The rod is supported by passing it through a rubber stopper at the top. So we have a rubber stopper here. It's an insulated material so that it does not conduct any charge. At the lower end of the rod is a brass plate. At this end here, we have a brass plate, okay? from which hangs two parallel stripes of thin, flexible gold leaf. So there's one leaf, there's another leaf. Two thin sheets of gold leaf. The gold leaf is preferred and used because it is one of the most conductive materials for electrical charges, okay? To protect the leaves from airflow, they are all enclosed in a bottle or metal casing with glass window connected to the earth. So there's one we can create for ourselves. Just use a glass tube, okay? We have our brass rod, the brass cap or ball, and then we have our gold leaf attached to the end of the rod. It's glass so that we can see clearly everything happening within, and also to keep out the air, we make use of a stopper. Because the gold leaf is very fragile and thin, air could affect its, you know, its movement. So all of that is enclosed in that way. Here's a more modern version of the gold leaf electroscope. Still has everything necessary. We have our brass cap or ball. We have the brass rod. We have our gold leaf electroscope. But in this case, it's calibrated so that we can find out the actual movement of the leaf. So how do we use the gold leaf electroscope to test or detect these electrical charges? Let's go on as we learn about this shortly. Experimentally, when charged objects are brought near the brass cap, electrons will either move out of it or move into it. So depending on 
the charge, if it is negative or positive, when you bring it close to the brass cap, what happens? Electrons will either move out of the brass cap into our material, or it will take some of the electrons from that material. Now, this brings about a change in the charges of the metal leaves inside the electroscope. So the general idea is whatever change or charge that is induced on our brass rod will affect the gold leaf at the end of that rod. So let's see what kind of changes that we may have. When we bring a negative object nearby, what happens? Free moving electrons in the electroscope, they move down into the leaves. When we bring a negatively charged material near our electroscope, free moving electrons within the electroscope moves down the leaves. Okay? We learned earlier that when charged materials are brought near neutral materials, there is a polarization on that neutral material. So we find a separation. We say that the positive charges all gather at the brass cap, while the negative charges are repelled. They are pushed down to the end of our brass rod where the gold leaves are attached. And the gold leaves acquire negative charges. Since both leaves have negative charges, what happens? They repel each other. They push against each other and they move apart. So when physically you see the gold leaf within your electroscope move apart, you can safely conclude that this material that was brought close so the electroscope is negatively charged. So that way, you already have been able to test and detect the type of charge on our material. Also, if you bring a positive object near your electroscope, the free electrons in the electroscope, they all start moving towards the top. So it's the opposite of the first instance. When you bring a positive material, okay, it also induces a polarization on the electroscope. The negative materials all gather at the top, while the positive materials all move down. And of course, our gold leaves, at the end of the rod, they react and they move apart. They repel each other because the gold leaves all become positively charged. Of course, we've learned that same charges would always repel each other. They would push each other apart while unlike charges would attract each other. Now, let's take another situation. If instead of just bringing okay, the charged material close to the electroscope, we actually touch the electroscope with any charged material, what happens? You will give the electroscope an overall charge by conduction. So whatever charge that material carries, the electroscope ends up becoming charged with that same charge. So if we bring a negatively charged material and touch it to our electroscope, the electroscope also acquires a negative charge. The leaves will stay spread apart even if you remove the object. So if you finally remove this object, this leaf here, which of course has become negatively charged, also will remain spread apart. Now, there are other things that a typical gold leaf electroscope can also do. The insulating or conducting properties of materials can be tested by the gold leaf electroscope. In order to do this, okay, we make use of a charged electroscope. Remember, before now, we've been using a neutrally charged electroscope, that is, it had no charge. But to test for the insulating or conducting properties, we make use of a charged electroscope. Now, if you have a charged electroscope and you bring a material in contact with an electroscope, to know if that material is an insulator, we will know if there is a leak or there is no leak of charge. If there is no leak of charge through that material, the leaf remains spread apart. So the initial way the leaf is, if there is no change, when we bring this material close to our charged electroscope, and our gold leaf remains stationary. It means that that material is a good insulator. But conversely, if the leaf collapses immediately, that is, instead of remaining separate, 
immediately collapses and probably even crosses each other. What happens? It means that that material is a good conductor. Because if that material carries a negative charge, for instance, we already have a positively charged electroscope. What happens? It will induce some of those electrical charges into our material. We already have a positively charged material. And then because of the difference in charges on the leaves, okay, they would collapse. They would attract each other and hence the collapse. With that, we'll know that we have a good conductor. Now, let's go on. Now, the gold leaf electroscope can also help us to test for the polarity of materials. The polarity of materials, if the material is negatively charged or positively charged. We can make use of the gold leaf electroscope to also find that out. Now, to carry out our experiment, induce a positive charge on the electroscope. If you bring a negative object near the positive electroscope, the electrons in the rod will be repelled towards the leaves, balancing the charge. So if we have a positively charged electroscope and you bring a negative material close to it, what happens? Some of those negative charges leaks into our electroscope. The electroscope is already positive and we have our negative charges from our material here. What happens is there is different charges on our gold leaf and hence they will move towards each other. They would collapse towards each other. Hence we can know that whatever material that was brought close to our positively charged electroscope is negatively charged. On the other hand, if you bring a positive object near our electroscope, which is already positive, what happens? It will attract the electron towards the terminal. Okay, if we bring that positive material here, as we can see, towards our positively charged electrodes, what happens? It will attract our electrons towards the terminals. Okay? Remember, there are more protons on the electrically charged electroscope than electrons, but the few electrons, okay, are however attracted to the terminals, while the majority of positive charges moves towards our gold leaves. And those gold leaves, of course, will repel, they will move apart because the charges are same. Same charges repel each other. Now, let's go on to learn about the distribution of charges. Conductors allow charges to move around freely. And if there are excess electrons anywhere in a conductor, where the same charges, of course, will repel each other, they push each other away until they move as far away from each other as they can, ending up on the outer surface. We already know that like charges repel each other. The word repel means they push away from each other. Now, when there are excess electrons on a material, what happens? These electrons will push against each other and push and push until they find themselves on the outer surface at an equal distance from each other. No charges usually remain inside the conductor. Once it has reached equilibrium, the charges stop moving. That's why we say it's electrostatic, okay? After all of this repulsion, okay, the charges stop moving when they've attained equilibrium. And then charges are stationary on the outside surface of a material. Hence the word static. They are static, that is fixed in a place. All right, now if the surface of our conductor is smooth and regular, for example, a sphere. Take a typical example here. If charge is transferred into our conductor here, we have a negatively charged material contacting our conductor, which is a sphere, round all through. These charges, like we've explained, will keep repelling each other and they start to move apart. So the charge was introduced here, but eventually these charges start moving apart. 
they are repelling, pushing away from each other. They would find themselves at a point on the outer or inner surface and finally push out of our material to station themselves on the outer surface of our material. The charge ends up evenly distributed over the surface of the conductor. So there are equal distances between each charge. They are evenly distributed over the surface of the conductor. We say what? They are uniformly distributed. Exactly the same distance from each other. In general, charges concentrate at places where the surface is sharply curved. If we take a sphere in figure one for an example, every surface of our sphere here, its circumferential surface, is what? Sharply curved. Equally sharply curved at all points, and hence these charges will stay at equidistance, uniformly distributed from each other. Now, the surface charge density, the charge per unit area, is usually very large at sharp points with small areas. So, for irregularly shaped objects or materials, this general rule again applies where charges will concentrate at places where our surface is sharply curved. We have one point here where our surface is sharply curved. So we find that the charges concentrate around this area. Here's another irregular shape. Our charges concentrate along the sharply curved areas. So we have more charges at that point. We say for irregularly shaped conductors, like a pear-shaped conductor shown here, the charges are distributed as shown. It therefore means that at most instances, we may have sparks at such points. When they discharge at this point, you'll find that for irregularly shaped objects, they are usually sparks given off when discharges discharge at this sharp point. And so we've come to the end of our class today. I'm sure you had a nice time. But before we go, let's take a recap to see all that we learned today. First, we learned that an electrical charge is the result of excess or insufficiency of electrons as compared to protons. We also learned that we can charge objects through either of three ways, friction, contact, or by induction. We learned that the gold leaf electroscope is used in the detection and testing of small charges. We learned also that considering the distribution of charges across materials, charges in general concentrate at places where the surface is sharply curved. We also learned that if the surface of our conductor is smooth and round like our regular sphere, the charges on it, they become uniformly distributed on the outer surface of our objects. Before we go, let's take two quick questions. Question one, electric charge on an atom is the result of surplus or deficit of dash relative to dash. A, protons, electrons. B, electrons, protons. C, neutrons, electrons. D, protons, neutrons. The correct answer is option B. Electric charge on an atom is the result of surplus or deficit of electrons relative to protons. Question two. Which of the following instruments can be used to detect and test small charge? A, electric tester. B, ground wire. C, glass rod. D, gold leaf electroscope. 
The correct answer is option D, gold leaf electroscope. And so, with all that we've learned today about electrical charges, I'm sure even at home, you'll be able to recognize some electrostatic charges in the environment. Till I see you next time in the part two of this series. Bye for now.